life would be good, church. And you know what? When we get to heaven, that's going to happen for us. Uh, it's the goal for us to get there and to be able to do that. Well, I want to say good morning uh, to everybody again. Uh, it, it's so good to have you come and, and be a part of the Sabbath day. You know, we planted a church on Isaiah 58, and it says not to forsake uh, uh, the assembly or the Sabbath and, and do what we just want to do on our own, but to come and praise God and worship Him. And to watch you, uh, uh, it's, it's really a blessing to have you here today. You never know when spring break uh, happens, who's going to be here or who won't be here, but uh, God has us here for a reason this morning. Last week we talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit and how he's uh, our power source of everything. And when I wrote that down, I couldn't help but think of Carolyn Edwards. We went out to Lisbon and, and uh, built a ramp Wednesday evening. And Carolyn, she's looking around. She don't see anywhere to plug the cord in. So they just go in the trailer and grab the generator like usual. And, and uh, Carolyn, she's pulling the starter cord and the thing's not starting. And I thought, man, there's something wrong with that because a Honda pulls one pole and it's running. And uh, Carolyn, she looks down and she had turned it on, but she didn't get it over on choke. And she reached down and grabbed that cord and yanked that thing and it took right off instantly, first pull. And I thought, how cool is that? That's, that's exactly uh, the resemblance of us and God the Father Almighty. God is almighty powerful. He's our source, church, for everything. But you know what? If we don't do what we can do ourselves, if we're not like that gasoline that that engine wasn't getting, if we don't reach out and do what God has called us to do in our own strength, he's not about to be our source of power. He needs us being obedient to what he's called us to do. And it's, it's just a really neat thing that uh, uh, we have a God that we can call on any time and any place. And Jesus promised he'd never leave us alone. That he would send an ambassador or a representative to take his place. And I love that thought because we don't really sit down and think about Jesus leaving. Uh, the, so many of the people, the Christians, Christ followers say, boy, how cool it would be to have Jesus with us. But you know what? Jesus ascended into heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And what did he do but send his spirit to be with us? to indwell us, to fill us up. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you and I walk, when we go, it didn't matter with Austin and us, we went to the Dominican Republic, the Spirit was powerful there, the Spirit's powerful here. No matter where you go, the Holy Spirit is powerful. And Jesus, even though he was God, was limited to his humanness on this earth. He could only be at one place. If they were at Jerusalem, they were at Jerusalem. But now, Holy Spirit-filled people are all over this world. And the glory, the light of God, the promise of God is everywhere. At the close uh, last week, Jesus tells his disciples, I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. And when I read that, it just makes me shiver. And I yelled out, who's the ruler of the world last week? And you all said, Satan. Satan. Everybody went on spring break that knew Satan. <laughs> no, not really. How many of us in here believe in angels? Oh, there's a lot of hands. A lot of hands. That's amazing. I love the scripture. It says, be careful to entertain a stranger. You might be entertaining an angel. You know what? There are a lot of us. I'm venturing to say that almost everyone in this room have talked to an angel sometime or another just as a test from God. We didn't even have a clue they were an angel. Have you ever looked around and talked to somebody and they were gone? I have. <laughs> Scary, kind of. 
Well, Satan was an angel. And that rascal thought he was better than God. And it wasn't long he was sent to this earth. And he is the ruler of this earth. Nasty. He's mean. Satan is a power force and a threat to God's chosen people. And he has one mission and it's to to destroy anything that God loves. If God is in it and he loves it, Satan's after it, church. It's unbelievable the hate he has for our God, the Father Almighty. And it was all because of his doing. And then in the scriptures we went on, Jesus made the declaration, he has no power over me. Jesus is telling the disciples, you know what, I'm heading to the cross. And you're going to watch me get nailed to that cross. They're going to beat me within an inch of my life. But they have no power over me. I am doing this because the Father has called me to do it. He did it out of the love for you and me, church, that we sang about in these songs this morning. Do you know that Jesus could have yelled out and there would have been 10,000 angels there in a split second? He didn't. He took the beating. He took the cross for you and me. What Satan means for bad, God turns to good. And Jesus tells us, he has no power over me. And that reassures them and it reassures me, church. If we have faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, Satan has no power over us. None. Unless he allows him to test us and touch us. But he can't kill us. Unlike Satan, Jesus came to give life. And our life lesson out of that is things are not always like they seem. You know, we look in our our man eyes and and look at things and we got to figure it out and and we just know that's why that happened and we have no clue sometimes why things happen none and it looks to satan and it looks to the people around uh, that area that satan has just killed the savior he wasn't savior at all but he he did what God wanted him to do and it's something he should have never done because it really messed him up for good when he took Jesus life as Easter approaches we uh, see the Savior alive and well after three days and Satan loses again I love that thought it's, it's so neat to have people come. Uh, we've got two major seasons that people come, Christmas and Easter. And this church probably will be full on Easter morning. And it's an awesome message. There's something, even though the world lacks and starves for Jesus and don't know who he is, there's something about Easter morning that draws people in to the church. <coughs> We know Satan deceived Eve. He killed God's perfect design for man. And Eve let him do it. And she not only let him do that to her, she went to Adam and and talked him into it. Death came to man both spiritually and physically. And total separation from God the Father is what happened. And it's never been corrected until Jesus came for our salvation. As we fast forward through John, we see Jesus focused and determined. Uh, I wrote on the sideline here, don't let circumstances overtake you. We can get to looking at our mess and our trouble and our problems, and we get so involved in them, so stuck in them, that Jesus can be working in our lives and around us, and we don't even see it, church. And it will kill us. I asked Tina uh, if I could pray over her this morning. Tina, would you come up here, please? Uh, I'm not embarrassing her or anything here. I, I ask her, so I don't want you thinking, oh my gosh, what are you doing to her, Mike? This girl has been going through a spiritual battle for some time here. And uh, it's about to do her in. And I... I uh, 
was able to call crosswinds and and to get her into counseling and she's been so sick she hadn't even been able to go to her meetings and I, I just want Tina to know that we're going to be praying for her that greater is he that is in her than the one that's in the world because that sucker has no no power, no authority over her whatsoever. And her circumstances have gotten her in a state of depression to where she just doesn't even want to get out of bed in the morning. So I want us all to stretch hands toward her. Uh, elders, I really would love you to come up here. I'm going to anoint her uh, with oil like scripture says in James 5. And we're going to pray over her. And if, if anybody wants to come up here, come up here. I don't, I'm not limiting it to the elders. I just mentioned them. Do you see how many people love you, Tina? Huh? Life's worth living, sweetheart. Just take your time coming up here. I'm, not, I'm in no hurry for this. It's crazy, Tina. They're, they're just all around you. See, life's worth living. It's worth getting better. You got a precious daughter standing here with you that loves you with all her heart. Life's good. And it's, it's just upside down for you right now. So we're going to pray over you and we're going to ask God to touch you in a powerful way and heal you. Uh, she's, she's on some medications and she's not eating right so it's got her stomach messed up. See how Satan just loves it. He don't, he don't hit us in just one little area. He just wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything we do. He ain't going to do it. We're taking authority and power over this in the name of Jesus. Lord, I anoint Tina uh, like your word says in James 5. If any among us are sick, let them call upon the elders and have them pray, and the sick will be healed. It doesn't say, Lord, shall be or could be or might be. It says they will be. And Lord, we're claiming that. We're expecting that for Tina in the name of Jesus right now. Lord, I'm asking you to touch her, to give her strength, to give her a cause and will to live and get out of bed and do life daily like it needs to be done. And Lord, reassure her that no one's going to look down at her because of the state of mind she's in. Lord, it's no different than a broken arm, a broken leg, a broken finger. When it's broken, we fix it. And Lord, we're asking you in the name of Jesus to touch Tina's mind and her heart and let them work together and let her know that she's a child of God. She was created in your image and you have never Ever, ever, ever made a mistake with anybody that you've created. So Lord, Holy Spirit, dear Jesus, touch her in a powerful way and cause her to be made whole. Give her strength, give her a sound mind, give her peace and love. Lord, you never had plans to harm her. You had plans to prosper her, to give her hope and to give her future, and to give her an abundant life. And Lord, we're praying for that right now in the name of Jesus. So Lord, listen to our hearts cry, our plea for her. And Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to let Tina step out in the strength she has, like you told Gideon to do, and you'll cover the rest. You'll take over and step into this darkness and turn it into light. And then Tina one day soon is going to be up here and she's going to have her hand on somebody else yes. that's yes. sick and broken yes. and in yes. bondage. Yes. So Lord, set her free. Break the yokes, break the chains and set her free. And we're asking all this in the name of Jesus. Yes. And every brother and sister said amen. 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 Go with God. He loves you and so do we. That's what church is about. 
It's what it's supposed to be about. And you know what? We've gotten into the place in our churches and in our lives and in Christianity to where we get beat up so bad that we don't have the, the will, we don't have the desire to get up in front of somebody and do what Tina just did. She just surrendered to the Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, church, I'm challenging every one of you, if you ever gossip, backbite somebody that is sick, God forgive you. Because it's no different like I prayed to Jesus than a broken arm or a broken finger. It's broken. It needs fixed. And we're counting on that for you, Tina. Hang in there. Put that smile. It takes less energy for a smile than it does a frown, hon. Get that smile on your face. Pick your head up and know that you're a child of God and He loves you and wants you back to Him. And don't any of you think I'm saying she was demon possessed. That, that, no. No, 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 no. She wasn't demon possessed. We get in a place to where we get so broken and so hurt that our heart separates from our mind. And we've got to get them back together. And a lot of times that takes counseling. And praise God for, for crosswinds. Uh, we, we're going to get her down there and they're going to unlock that key that's got her bound up. And it's going to link her, her precious mind and her heart back together. And she's going to be made whole. It's going to be fun. It's going to be good to watch. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Tina, for letting us do that. As we fast forward through John, I told you that Jesus is focused and determined. And, and I said, don't let your circumstances overtake you. And that's the place that Tina is in right now. She's let her circumstances overtake her. And so many of us in this room do the same thing. I've been there 101 times, church. Let my circumstances get in the way of Jesus and the power he wanted to give me and display in me. Don't let your circumstances get in the way of a blessing from the Lord. He warns his disciples that all of them will betray him in one way or another. And I can only imagine what it'd be like sitting with Jesus, somebody I'd followed for three years, and he'd look me in the eye and says, You know what? You guys are going to betray me. And I thought, how sad that would be. But then I think, you know what? We as human beings betray the Lord Jesus in all kinds of ways every day. We break his trust. And that hurts just as bad as what Peter did with him. And Peter hears that every one of you is going to betray me. And oh, good old Peter, he mouths off before he thinks every time. He says, no, even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you, Lord. And all the other disciples vowed the same. They were all in agreement at least. You know what? We're sticking up for you, Jesus. We got your back. And it's just going to be a few more days here as we get into the next week here that, uh, wow, things go really bad. And last week we talked about professing Christians. Um, those that profess to be a Christian. And these guys are professing right now, Jesus, we got your back. But boy, when we talk, isn't it cheaper than walking it? It's a whole lot easier to open our trap than it is to get it done. Oh, I've been there way too many times. Talk's easy to do. The obedience is hard. When I read that scripture, I began to think of the times that I've let Jesus down. Um, promised to serve him really well and did it half-heartedly. Said things that I couldn't carry out. I thought I could at the time. But how many know we can't determine what tomorrow brings? We have to be careful with our promises, church, because we don't know if we even have tomorrow. 
I've been short with someone that needed grace. Um, I, I really am working on that one because I get kind of short with people that I run the same old, same old, same old over with. Uh, when, you know when Mikey feels like he's counseled somebody too much? When I can finish their sentences. <laughs> and I'm telling you, church, I've got a couple of them. Every time they open their mouth, you know what they're saying next. And they don't grab a hold of the, the power through the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And then I get short with them. And Jesus, he, he wants me to show them grace. I've hung on to my pride and selfishness. Has anybody ever felt with, dealt with that? Oh my gosh. It's been all about me way too much. Pride will kill us, church. Pride comes before the fall. Right. Ask Satan. He'll tell you. Just when Jesus wanted to use me in a powerful way, I, I abandoned him. So I can relate with Peter and the guys. You know, uh, it, it, even though it was radical, uh, God had that plan in place. He put those guys in place and he had them do everything that they, they did so it would work out for his good in the end. God always takes our bad and turns it to good, church. If we love him, we're called to his purpose. You got to be called to his purpose, though. So. It all makes me aware of how much I need a sa uh, Savior. I took a, it took a perfect, holy, and committed sacrifice for all mankind. I love the, the song we sang this morning, the Lamb of God. And I think of Peter, when he was bold, he was so weak. And Thomas, he was a realist sort, realistic sort of a guy. Uh, just show me and I'm in, Jesus. You know they they get they call him doubting Jesus, but I don't I don't think Jesus or Thomas was a doubter. He just had to be shown that this is the real deal, and there's there's nothing wrong with that at times. We all fall short of the glory of God. I wrote down every one of us in this room need a savior. And that's what we're working up to here the next couple weeks is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells Thomas and the others why he came uh, to reconnect us to the Father and his love for us. So we're going to go in uh, John 14 this morning. It's beautiful scripture. Uh, this scripture has been quoted a lot. How many of you got your Bibles? Oh, we're doing good. Bring your Bibles. This scripture fits so many applications, it's unbelievable. Uh, the biggest, biggest uh, time I use this, this scripture is at a funeral. And when I start reading it, we're all going to know what it says. Uh, it, it's peaceful. Jesus wants the disciples aware of what's ahead. He's telling them, I'm going to leave. And what I love about Jesus' church is he wants us comforted, not afraid. So many people think that if they surrender their lives and hearts to God, he's just going to beat them up and crash them, and they're not going to be able to do anything they want to do in life. And God, Jesus, is a comforter. He has the windows of heaven that he can open up and pour out a blessing. Scripture says that you and I can't even begin to contain Jesus loves us, and he wants to bless us. In John 14, 1, Jesus tries to give them comfort. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, and trust also in me. Has anybody ever walked around with a troubled heart? Uh, I do about four or five times a day. Until you put yourself in check and say, whoa, wait a minute. This, this is nothing to worry about. Come on. A troubled heart. And he's telling them that, you know what, guys? I'm going to die. They're going to kill.
kill me and I'm going to be resurrected. I'm leaving. But I don't want your hearts to be troubled. I'm going back to the Father in heaven and I'm going to make you a mansion that is unbelievable. There ain't no master carpenter on earth can build a mansion like Jesus has got waiting for you and me. We all have walked with troubled hearts and Jesus gives the remedy. He says, trust in the Father and trust in me. And like I ask you, does anybody struggle trust, trusting Jesus? Boy, there are days, there are times. You'd think being a pastor and being trained and, and dealing with things and watching the miracles of God and everything, that you would never struggle trusting God. But I want to tell you what, when you get on somebody's deathbed and you've watched them suffer for eight months, you just wonder, Lord Jesus... And he always, has a, he always has a purpose for that. And sometimes we don't grab a hold of it. We don't get to see what it is on this side of heaven. But I'm telling you, there are days that, that you struggle with trust in him. And then those of us that are super spiritual, that's what we tell people. All you got to do is trust in Jesus. Yeah, right. It's not that simple. It's the truth, and it works, and it is what we need to do. But when somebody says to you, all you got to do is, is be careful. Because that ain't all you got to do. It really gets hard. Jesus says the whole purpose of his existence in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. That's powerful scripture. No one, that means no one, church, can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And there are so many faiths, so many religions out there that do not have Jesus Christ at the center of their faith. And they have no faith at all. Because any other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ is a lie and a fake. The world tells us there is no absolute truth. And I think as a pastor, that's one of the biggest things that I'm dealing with today as a pastor with people. I mean, I, I get some people when I preach that just really get in my face. And when I mention different things, um, they just come unglued. And we're in this culture, this society, we're in a time right now where everybody has to love everybody. And I was thinking back, uh, uh, back in the hippie days when, when I was growing up, all oh, you need is love, man. <laughs> and then if you had one of these, it helped a little bit too. <laughs> And we, huh? Did you have long hair? No, I had a fro like this, bro. And then those, uh, what was the name of the pants? No, no, they were them peg babies. You couldn't get your foot through. And then I went to the bell bottoms. Yeah. Oh Lord, have mercy. Now you guys mess me all up. You started it. All you need is love. People right now are on the love kick. If you run somebody down, well, you got to love them. You know what Romans says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But it also tells us in there, you spare the rod, you spoil the child. What is the whole purpose of this faith walk with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior with all the commands? I said last week there are 1,050 commands in the New Testament. Why did he put the commands in there if we won't confront one another with our sin and help one another get over it? 
I can love people till the cow comes home. And if they're out of God's will, they're going to hell. And it's not my fault. They chose it. Scripture says they already condemned themselves. God never sends anybody to hell. The person is out of his will and send themselves. Church, we got to get over this love kick. Because we're letting people live in their sin. Die in their sin. Because we don't have the courage and the guts to, to confront them in their sin. And I've had people tell me, you need to change your phone number and your email address. No, I don't care. I just look at it and let it go on. Because there are people like Tina that texted me last night for prayer. Love. All you need is love. No, all you need is Jesus. Amen. And love people through His love. And when he says, no, you can't do it, no, you don't do it. Right. It's that simple. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the way. Uh, way here means a path or a route. Jesus says, I am the path to eternal life. He says, I am the route to eternal life. And those of us that have studied the word know that the path to destruction is wide. But the path to heaven is narrow. It's hard to stay on that narrow path. Jesus is the only way to salvation, the only path to heaven, and the only way to the Father. The only way. And I've told you so many times, um, the little sauna that said here with us from uh, Afghanistan, the Islam little gal, she said, Dad, I love the same God you love. I said, yes, Sana, but you're missing the link. His name's Jesus. They do. They go through the first five books of the Bible. They preach and teach that first five books of that Bible, but they don't have Jesus. And church, if any of you in here today are sitting here without Jesus, we need to talk to you before you leave. We want to pray with you so you have Jesus in your heart. It's nothing shameful, nothing scary about it at all. But we need to talk to you. Acts 4, uh, 12 tells it plain. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And it's the name of Jesus. His whole purpose and plan. Jesus says he's truth. He says, I'm the way. He says, I'm the truth. He has established truth, church. Jesus is the source of all truth. And today, men and women are filled with opinions. And opinions are not truth. They're opinions. Man lies to himself when he thinks his opinions are truth. He's deceiving himself. Psalm 119, 142 says, Your law is the truth. And thank God Jesus fulfilled that law. He came. He didn't take it away, but he sure did fulfill it. And what a blessing that is. We know that God... Can anybody dispute that the Ten Commandments, just the Ten Commandments, are not true and real? They're truth. They're yea and amen. The life. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. He tells us plainly, because I live, you will live also. Real life is deliverance from a life of bondage to sin and death and hell. It's deliverance. Real life. And that's what we just did for Tina this morning. We, we are, have opened the door for her to have her real life back again. Jesus' life he gives brings freedom in heaven for all eternity. I, I just, that blows my mind when I think about it. Jesus is our source for both spiritual and physical life. 
when Adam and Eve took the bite of that fruit in the garden, they lost their spiritual life and they lost life because they were going to live forever. That curse is with us today. It's on all man, men and women without Jesus. And it's appointed once for man to die, Scripture says. And if you die to yourself and accept Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, that surrender, that is death. You died with his death, burial, and resurrection. You were resurrected a new creation in Christ Jesus when you did that. And Scripture says we're appointed once to die. So if we have Jesus in our hearts and in our lives, when we die, our body goes to the ground, to the dust from which it came, and the Spirit returns to the Lord who gave it. Hallelujah. I was talking to Laura and Chris this morning. Chris's mama is in the hospital uh, with COPD, and uh, she's really struggling to breathe, so we need to be praying for her really, really hard. But they said they got on, on each side of her and grabbed her hands, and she was out. And they prayed over here, and they could see this tear running down her cheek. She was out. Her spirit wasn't. Church, whenever you go with a family member in a hospital room, don't you ever be afraid to talk to them or to pray for them. Because their spirit is alive, and it never dies. Now when Jesus returns and, and calls those that have died and raises them up into heaven with him and then he calls us up, then we get new bodies. These old, trashy, fat, broken down, wrinkly, bald. <laughs> it all goes. And we get a spiritual body. No more sickness, no more sadness, no more sorrow. I don't know about you, but that sounds really good to me. Jesus is our source for both spiritual and physical life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is headed to the cross to restore life to all mankind. Um, I've, I've pondered this all my, my days of accepting him as Lord and Savior. And run, I don't know how many Easter's that's been. But I really have thought about that. How... You could take two weeks of your life and get to the point to where you're so distressed over it that you sweat blood, but yet still go through with it. For you and me, people like you and me, church. When we lose our way, Jesus is the way. And when we're deceived or lied to, Jesus has the truth we can count on. When life takes a turn for the worse, Jesus has the answer to our circumstances. He says, trust in God and trust in me. Church, we've got to get more serious about trusting the Lord and trusting Jesus. We have to. He paid a heavy price for our freedom. Sin had separated us from God the Father Almighty. I think about kicking Adam and Eve out of that garden. And then so, just so they wouldn't get back in. He put angels with swords to guard that thing. Separated. Can you imagine being so close and personal with God the Father Almighty that you walked with Him in the cool of the evening and talked to Him just like we're talking? And then to suddenly, instantly lose that because of a bad decision. Do you know we'd still be in that same position, that same place with God the Father right now if Jesus hadn't died and paid our sin load? Scripture says the wages of sin is death. And we would be sentenced to hell. But Jesus paid the price. In Matthew 1.21, we're told plain and simple, The angel said to Mary, You will have a son, 
And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I love that. Can you imagine being a 14, 15 year old girl uh, going to conceive the, the Christ child <laughs> and be told that your son's going to save the world from their sins? Can any of you girls imagine what that would have felt like or been like? John 129. John the Baptist is a forerunner of Jesus, and he was sent ahead of Jesus to say that Jesus, the Savior, is coming. And in John 1, 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, a human being, but God at the same time, a sacrificial lamb for you and me. Jesus didn't come to cover our sin, church. He came to take it away. And from the time Adam and Eve sinned up until Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it was a cover-up. It had to be done all the time. Clay, you know how many sheep you'd have to make to have sacrifices for all us bad people in this room alone? And they'd have to be good with no blemish. They'd have to be the firstborn. Take a lot of young yos, wouldn't it, to have a firstborn? That was a big deal in the day. Big deal, church. And Jesus died and paid for it all. One sacrifice for you and me. And it cost him his life so you and I could live ours. Have it back. <coughs> Easter is the most beautiful time of year. Spring is here, hopefully. Flowers are popping out of the ground. Leaves are popping on the trees. We see new life coming just really everywhere you look. Unless you're in Indiana and it could be a blizzard. <laughs> But it's a beautiful time of the year. You and I were given a new lease on life. And God helps us to never take Jesus. I'm, I'm saying God help us never take Jesus for granted. Because it's so easy to do in the land and the time we live in. Let's ask others to come for Easter Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a breakfast, and we we just shared our small groups and, and started them, and we had our meal and broke bread together, and we're going to break bread together on Easter morning. Uh, we always have a really good attendance for that. It's really awesome. The girls cook, and it's just really good. It's a time, a place where you can invite those around you that are broken and lost and need Jesus. And they can be in a safe environment where we'll love them and pray for them and hope that Jesus... I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Praise God. I was preaching one Sunday in the other church. My phone rang. I forgot to take it off and lay it on my desk and my phone rang. And everybody's looking at me like, I said, that better be God or somebody's in trouble. <laughs> it wasn't God. Bring them. It's just like Tina this morning. Uh, she she texted me last night and asked me to pray. And, and Tina, I've got a confession. I was in bed, honey. I was out like a light. But I woke up this morning and saw that first thing this morning. And I prayed for her. And then I texted her back. 
get out of bed, take a shower, and come and let Jesus touch you. Satan hates that. You know, it's when we're in our sickest, darkest time that we leave Jesus. I wonder why that is. Why we do that to ourselves. It's the time we need to knuckle down and throw our boots on and get out the door and sit in the house of the Lord and just sing and praise with all our heart and expect Him to touch us in a powerful, mighty way. And it's so hard to do. I pray for all of us in here that we can continue to grow and turn our temperature dial up so we get above lukewarm and start touching hearts and lives. We start touching the Tinas that are curled up in a fetal position in their bed and bless their hearts. They just don't want to get out. We should be light in that darkness for her. That's our call. It's our purpose to be light in a dark place. And we can do it. We can share the good news with those you bring and not do it in a threatening way. And share Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, with them. It's the best thing that's ever happened for us, church. He's alive. I can't wait to sing He's Alive on Sunday. Beautiful song. Greatest, one of the greatest songs ever written. He's alive. I'm going to have the elders come up here right now. and uh, They're going to be up here for you. If you're in a dark place or uh, anything's going on in your life, I just want you to come up here. Don't leave here broken, people. You can trust these elders that are up here to pray for you. You can trust them. What's said here stays here. And you can be set free before you go. And your heart will not be troubled or burdened. And you can go out these doors and you can talk to somebody that's broken or having a real difficult time and share the love of Jesus with them. The way, the truth, and the life. The one that can get you to God the Father. Are you looking forward to Easter? Yes. I am. I'm looking forward to seeing family I haven't seen for a long time. There's so much good in that day. So let's let's just really I want I want all of you I'm I'm asking you to pray for me to be able to give a good Easter Sunday message. I'm asking that we pray for all those that are going to invite and ask people to come. Let's be in prayer for Easter Sunday. Jesus had the courage and the will to go to the cross for us. How about us having the will and the courage to invite somebody that's never heard that story before? I don't want to call it a story. It's a message. Because it's not a story. It's real. The real deal. Father, uh, we just thank you so much for your love, mercy, and grace that you give each and every one of us. And it's new. Our, your mercies are new every morning, each and every day for us, Lord. Every one of us wake up in a, in a, uh, uh, a morning and, and we're just... Uh, some of us are just lost at what we need to be doing. We don't feel like we have a sense of purpose. We have no plan. Nothing's rewarding in our lives anymore. So Lord, I'm just asking you to instill in each one of us a burden of fire down deep in our hearts for the lost. The people that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Father, they're everywhere. And Lord, there are a lot of places, a lot of churches have lost faithful people. They've given up on you. They've given up on the church. They've given up on everything to do with Christ following. Lord, I pray you would touch their hearts and draw them back to you. 
And Lord, as the pastors in this city and the other churches prepare for Easter, I pray that you would give them an awesome message. I pray that every church in this town is overflowing with people on Easter morning. That they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they can take it into their hearts and be transformed, renewed by the touch of the Holy Spirit and the message of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, uh, just uh, touch the Pulver family this morning. We're so thankful for their uh, godly hearts that they, they wanted the children uh, uh, dedicated this morning. Lord, we just thank you for the family and, and uh, the friends that have sacrificed time maybe out of this morning to come and be with them, to show them their love for them. Lord, I pray a blessing over them as well. Lord, just go with us. This world is dark. It gets darker by the second. And we need to be brighter and brighter by the second. So Lord, uh, just uh, cause us to be bold and strengthened. So we can be your witnesses. Your hands, your feet, and your eyes to our communities that so desperately need you. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Again, the elders are going to come up here and pray with you, so don't leave without prayer. Come on. Trouble won't throw me, won't break me, won't skin me.